Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Marchuk. Welcome to the Transform Now podcast. Our guest on this episode is Andrew Amen. Andrew is the CEO and co-founder of 923 Studio, an award-winning AI agency that builds products for startups and established brands. He's founded 14 companies. I don't know how you do that at your age, but 14 companies hold two patents and has extensive experience in digital business transformation. Andrew has been advising companies on how to structure digital businesses uh, to maximize the return on investment for over 18 years. He recognizes digital business models and how they operate based on years of executing digital transformation within multiple industries. We'll be chatting with Andrew today about building innovation based on human-centered experiences uh, using AI, as well as how to succeed at being an entrepreneur um, within your current organization. So I am really looking forward to this conversation. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Michael. I'm glad that you are here. So please, I, 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 I summarize a whole bunch of stuff from a bio. Tell me, tell me who you are. So yeah, I'm Andrew. I was a mechanical engineer, worked on nuclear submarines and came up with some patents on tracking parts in a manufacturing floor, which required me to write those patents myself. Uh, and I had to calculate all the software that was needed. So that's how I got into software. I've started learning not only how to write software, but how to figure out when there's a bunch of variables, how to solve for those variables. Um, and my, when I was trying to run around the world and install these into nuclear power plants, I realized it was kind of hard to build for somebody else especially with an idea that was new and innovative. And so it took me into a world in which I wanted to run a business myself or be a part of a business. And that led me to a co-founder who just said, you know, we're not gonna build any hardware parts. And I agreed with him and said, I know how hard it is to do hardware. And we ended up coming up with the QR codes that transform information between two and two people when they meet. Uh, so we had a digital business card business for six years. And then in 2016, we sold that business, kept the agency, started building AI products in 2016. And, you know, the rest is history. We've been building 150 products over those years uh, for about 75 clients. And it's just the iterations and the business models and the people that I'm talking to in the last two or three years, they're massive products with massive results. And it's been a lot of fun to be that, that, that not servant, but like that advisor and that advocate to larger companies to make sure that those products go well and to make sure that like we're building something that has a huge impact. You know, that makes a lot of sense. So. Um, you've had a lot of experience building these products, but you also had a lot of experience with AI starting in 2016, um, primarily from sort of an algorithm, algorithmic kind of viewpoint of things, maybe machine learning and whatnot. Um, large language models kind of changed a lot though, as we get into, you know, end of 2022. Um, as these are revolutionizing kind of the, the way that we interact with computers and the way that we see data and whatnot, um, or maybe going back to kind of looking at how humans interact with each other too, but what are some of the uh, potential considerations that companies should keep in mind while they're implementing these large language model or generative AI kind of technologies? Yeah, great question. And you are completely right. We were building AI for a while and the first many years was in machine learning. Uh, and Gen AI has changed the game into the ability for humans to be able to read, process, and I'm, I'm sorry, the ability for robots to be able to read, process, and reason the same way humans do. And so that unlocks a whole plethora of tools that can be utilized. And we're seeing the products come onto the, onto the mainstream of, of different ways to use the Gen AI systems. But what I truly think an enterprise company is, is should be looking at for the advantage and the moat that they can create with an AI product is using their data as that moat to create a Gen AI knowledge base, a place in which their employees or their clients or their customers can go to find information that has been trained, processed, and proceduralized around the culture and values of that company. And that's why it's, we believe it's a custom Gen AI future with custom code, because we have to train that model to understand the brand, the voice, the style, and also the FAQs and the procedures are different for every HR company, every HR department inside of a company. And so we think it's important to make sure that that employee or that, it, that knowledge base that's going to be helping those employees is trained on the culture and the brand specifically for that company. And so that's what we've been doing. And that's the first step is to make sure that that knowledge base is robust, that it has the right information, that it doesn't hallucinate and provides the right information to the employee that's calling for it. And then you can take it to the next level and take that to your customers that are interacting with your database or interacting with your company uh, and start ensuring that those customers are having non-hallucination non well, there's a word there, right? Non there's a word there. That's a big one, though. Yeah. Some of those 50 cent words. Yeah, non-hallucinogenic uh, conversations with with that company. 
and so that it can be trustworthy and it can be controlled by the company itself if it does have problems. And so that's what we build, and I think that's where companies can start. I'd say that's a good place to, to ask a different kind of question then. So when you see uh, organizations like OpenAI, Microsoft, AWS, they're, they're all coming uh, um, anthropic, large language models, they built their like massively massive, beyond reasonably massive. Um, and they have a ton of data that gets sort of generic pumped into it. So they know everything about Paris, France. They know everything about plumbing. They know, I mean, they have silly things, right? There's they, everything, everything about everything. It gets just joke jammed into them, these large language models. You're suggesting perhaps maybe refining a model that's not necessarily a massively trained large language model, but one that's more tuned for an organization. Where does that, where does that line sit leveraging a, I would say, an a, a openly available, uh, like open AI kind of um, model versus one that's trained specifically? Yeah, so when you think of the internet, it is a very, very interesting place of different viewpoints and what we consider what is a fact and what is not a fact. And there's some great use cases of facts that we've all used to believe in. Like my favorite one is that Pluto used to be a planet and is no longer a planet. There are some people that still hold on to that, but for the most part, we've recognized that- Is Pluto the earth really flat then? Yeah, so that that one, yeah. So that you can find a corner of the internet that I'm sure there's a giant community that believes that and has a bunch of copious information about that and can recall that and say, hey, because of A, B, and C, the earth is flat. So the large language models that have been trained are basically the foundation model that is trained on this data has all of that knowledge and whether we all know the earth is flat or round, there is that information inside of that large language model. And so Microsoft, if you remember back in 2021, when they released the first version of this, it was not calling facts correctly because there wasn't that control layer that the humans had put on top of the large language models to do things like protect it from people hurting themselves, protect it from things that are just not true. And while it was trained on the internet, there is this layer that we are installing onto these systems to ensure that that fact that fact is actually a fact and that it's believable and traceable to some sort of source. Now, the argument can be, is that proper to do from a company like ChatGPT or OpenAI? Are there opinions associated into that layer as well? Because if they are, I wanna know those opinions so that if I'm writing something specifically for my company and I don't believe in that opinion, I wanna be able to turn that off so that I can have a conversation with the part of the internet that I believe in. And so we have a few systems we've written. Um, we've written some code for political companies that are very obviously bipolar and, and going back and forth between an argument of trying to figure out like, this is one side of the argument and there are facts to back it up. And this is another side of the argument and there are facts to back that up. But if I'm talking down one side, I need to only focus on that information. So from a company standpoint, like it's very important for you to know where you stand. And that's where your policies, procedures, and your company culture comes in because people work for that company for a reason. And then they start to have a commonality between them. You know, the Malcolm Gladwell book about the tipping point, there's a new one now called Revenge of the Tipping Point. And it's a great study when you get a community together. And as that community starts to grow and build a product together, they get to that, what he calls the magic third, when it tips into a culture. And that's where you find the culture of HubSpot, where there's a lot of abbreviations. And you can't just roll into HubSpot and, and talk the way that people at HubSpot do. You have to learn that culture and then be a part of it. So companies need to know that, that they are, you know, building a culture and building a brand and building data that is very independent than the rest of the internet. So it's really important for them to train their model and their knowledge base on their viewpoints. And for better or worse, that means maybe fine tuning the model in a very specific way or guard railing it a very specific way or using multiple models to ground it on each other so that their facts can still remain their facts. But I think what's really important, especially in capitalism, is that these companies exist for a reason and the communities around them can support that that idea or that belief. I like that idea. So with the varied number of projects that you've worked on, from the specific industries you mentioned one there's many many others um you start talking about these pro these projects themselves that may be leveraging similar technology um i want to say what's your secret sauce but how do you what are the key elements that you use to, to stay successful from project to project when they are so varied yeah i love the alan Weiss uh model of consulting 
we're, we're consultants because people value the, the information that we can bring to them at the speed in which we consult, but also from the knowledge that we've gained from all of the other industry projects that we've worked on. And so we're not like industry specific because it's not important for us to be really good at healthcare or really good at manufacturing. It's really good. We're in a good position to take a product and install an AI system and then train the company on how to use that AI system. And if you focus on that being our niche or that being what we're good at, it's our superpower. And so we have employees that can support that. We have clients that are interested in that. And our marketing teams, their job is to make the messaging similar to that. And so where we differ is we don't just take a product and build it to spec, which is what a lot of agencies do. And they do very good job when they're tasked to do that. We, we understand business models. We understand we built startups ourselves. And we understand how to put a really good team that solves problems together onto your product so that they can continue their problem solving skills on the new product. And if we do that and we do that properly, we're taking an idea and transforming it inside of a business with the availability of finding revenue streams and profitability from that new product. And I think that's where we differentiate from other clients or other agencies is we only focus on those clients that need that type of skill set of taking a zero to one product, but really having the money to, to focus on like a four to five month sprint and then taking that product and, and installing it into the giant you know, product suite of, of products that they have at their company, but ensuring that this product has the return on investment and the profitability that it was originally set out to do. So when you see, you, see, you mentioned that it's, it's, it is across industry because you're working on the company itself to do this. Um, has it been difficult for you or your team to adapt the technologies or the people to the technologies within these organizations? Because I suspect as you're making transitions like this, um, the transformations can be somewhat disruptive. How have you approached that? Yeah, it's becoming harder than I thought it was going to be. When Jet AI came out, I kind of did a celebratory dance because I was like, great, now everyone's going to realize what we do as a company and we're going to have leads, you know, to the cows come home. But that didn't happen. It, it, it's AI is a transformation just like the cloud was. It's very slow to start and you're waiting for your competitors to do it to make sure that you're going to be doing, as a CEO, you're going to be doing the right move for your company. And you got to remember that a lot of CEOs, they're looking at three year return on investments because they're not going to be there for 10 or 15 years. They need to make that impact, whether it's on the stock market or for the private investors or the board, they need to make that impact sooner. So they have to make those decisions. But before 2022, they were already trying to carry out the decisions from 2021 into 2024. So building new CRMs, building new infrastructure, building better cloud systems. They're already in the middle of those projects or at the end of those projects. And for anyone that's gone through a cloud transformation, they still have the scars and the pain from like, it was supposed to take two years and we're on year 10. So jumping into AI is something that they're just not sure of. So not only do I have to sell the idea that we're gonna save them a bunch of money, we're also trying to sell them on the idea that this is the right decision for their business and they have to act now. Because if they don't, they're gonna fall behind the, their competitors that are starting to see the benefits of efficiency gains that AI can have. And so we like to tout the idea of, of revenue per employee. We, we are seeing a lot of results right now that when we deploy these systems, we can take the same number of workers in that company and produce more revenue with them. And so as we stack those case studies, uh, people at CEOs are finally starting to realize, maybe I should try this, but not only should I try it internally because I don't have the resources, let me try it with an agency like 923 that's done it a bunch of times before so that we can prove out that ROI. So that it's more like convincing plus showing trust, plus showing them to now's the right time, all of that coming together for the person to say, let's go. Or if one of those doesn't work, let me wait until I have, you know, that triangle put together for us to start. So you mentioned that you, know, you talked about the, the CEOs and their perspective or their viewpoint on this, which of course is to support the shareholders of the board or, or to whomever they're responsible. Um, but when these technologies and these decisions are made, obviously they're going to be uh, say affecting, but they're going to be impacting the employees in the organization, those folks in the middle and lower levels of the organization who are executing on the plans that were made two or three years ago. Um, how do these transitions affect the employees, especially when you're making such, say, such big bets, um, transitioning to uh, an AI platform or an AI direction? Yeah, one of my favorite uh, case studies that we've done recently was for an insurance company. And they had salespeople that from the morning 
like, let's say 8 a.m. till 5 p.m., they had 12 to 16 slots available to do a sales call to help sell insurance products. And they were getting, let's say 50 to 60% of the time, just wasted calls. That was people not showing up. That was for somebody calling for life insurance and they actually needed pet insurance. And so those half hours that were dedicated to do that call was wasted. And so those sales individuals were tasked with doing procedural work or human resource work or in anything internally. But ideally, they were hired to sell product. And so what our AI system did was qualify the people at the very beginning of the funnel and ensure that when they were getting to the salesperson, that they were qualified and asking for a product that was necessary for that person to sell and that that person had the capability or the experience to sell that product. So we were pre-qualifying. The second we released that, those salespeople, they didn't have to replace the humans. They didn't have to like make sure that more humans were hired. They just took those eight, I'm sorry, 16 slots in a day because there's half hour slots and we filled them for every single half hour. And we made that salesperson more efficient by talking to better people. Now the results were, were, were creating about $5 million of revenue from the second that gets released. That has nothing to do with removing employees or adding employees. It's just making those employees do the tasks that they were assigned to do more frequently throughout the day. And we're seeing that time and time again, whether it's with work order management, whether it's with insurance companies, we're doing a project right now for uh, shipping containers, like all of these products and all of these ideas, the employees are, are dedicated and, and they're really skilled at doing that task. If the AI can help them do that more repeatedly throughout the day, there should be more product and more revenue to be created on the top end. And that's what we love to see with these case studies. I like the way you're approaching that because that makes a lot of sense uh, in the way you can see it's not just about cost savings because oftentimes that they may be there, but the reality is this is the growth that you're trying to get um, and your revenue per employee, great metric to leverage to support that uh, that transition from before to after and really showing the benefits. So as you're building these applications out, uh, I'm sure you've seen some very interesting ones. So. Um, what are the most exciting AI applications that you've seen that are sort of pushing the boundaries of innovation? Yeah, one of my favorite AI projects is a complete machine learning project. So it's not anything to do with Gen AI. Uh, it is a project we started in 2019 with a company called Dataflick. And they came to us with data sets that allowed us to combine together, whether it's data, data information about houses, about demographics, about uh, prison paperwork, or people getting divorced paperwork, all of those signals were put into a giant database that we managed for, for Dataflake. And at the end of the day, after four years of doing machine learning algorithms and predictions, we're able to now predict with 85% accuracy houses that go for sale in any zip code in the United States. So basically you input a zip code and you say, hey, next month, I would love to know which houses are for sale. And we can use all of those signals that we've trained the database on to predict which of those houses is going to be for sale. And with 85% accuracy, they're seeing incredible results, not only on their, you know, their cap table and people trying to provide them money so that they can go from a series A to a series B, but also for their customers and their clients and the ability to uh, be a real estate agent and go to a market and say, I only need to knock on three houses today because I'm sure these three, one of two of these three houses are going to go for sale next month. So the, that information that can be provided now from crawling the internet, from crawling these databases, and then merging them together in very unique ways does give a, a very massive opportunity to new companies to come up and say, I have an idea that people will pay money for. If you can organize the data in a very specific way for me, I can make a bunch of money, do, or the company can make a bunch of money doing this and selling that idea to their customers. And I love that type of, of result. As another, another one of those, if you say kind of message, which is focusing the efforts where they're going to get the best return. That's and right. And I think that's fantastic, a fantastic way, again, applying the technology to allow us to be more uh, effective at what we do during our normal business days. So that's that's exactly. really cool. So um, there are a bunch of people out there who, who are right now, they're, they're not startups, they're not founding their own companies, they're in an organization and they see with their own two eyes um, the inefficiencies or the potential that AI could probably have within their organization, but they're not really sure what to do next. So how do you, how would you advise an intrapreneur to um, to take the next step in leveraging these types of technologies to get the benefits that they perceive? Yeah, I love my career has stemmed from being an intrapreneur. I, I truly think that any young engineer or young aspiring founder of a company should start as an intrapreneur inside of a massive company and, and have those at bats. 
because right now is the best time to be playing with new tools and new pl new ways to provide innovation to a company. And if companies don't want to listen to outside voices, they will listen to inside voices. And that's where these intrapreneurs can, can really strive. Because if you can take an idea, a product or a competitor, and you can see what they're doing with AI and bring that to your bosses and, and the people inside of your company and say, look, I'll spend extra two hours every single week testing this and just give me the access. I'm just going to play around. I'm just going to see how this is going to work. You can start testing with these AI solutions and providing real results for your, for your company and then just showing them on the side how it's benefiting the rest of the company. When I was an entrepreneur for a manufacturing shop uh, doing nuclear parts, I spent 20, I, had, I think it was 20 presentations to the same people with the same PowerPoint presentation showing the return on investment that was going to be five to six X what it was from the cost of doing the project. And it was a no brainer to me, but obviously it needed to be the right time. Somebody needed to be an owner of it that was going to take me under their wing in their department and help me grow this. But then more importantly, it had to like interrupt some of the shop floor processes and people had to be aware and actually let that happen. And so I had rules, of course, that I couldn't interrupt the entire shop and, and ruin some of the revenue that they were trying to do, and especially their outputs. But I did have a, a, an owner that took a belief in me and said, not only will I back you, I will support you in the needs that you have at this manufacturing shop so that you can deploy what you need to deploy, but you cannot interrupt them. And so once you get that owner, now even that 20th time I presented to the CEO, they still said, is this going to work? You need to truly execute and you need to act like an entrepreneur there where you're going to fail a bunch and you have to be very transparent and say, hey, I tried this. It didn't work. I'm going to try again. And I think any boss that has hired people in the past, when they see that that tenacious attitude or somebody that's waking up in the morning and just has energy to try something new for the business, it is someone, a, a good boss at least, is going to let that person take those at bats. And so for you as the entrepreneur, or the intrapreneur, having the, the opportunity to take at bats, like don't let that go. Just keep swinging and keep trying and keep trying to figure out which AI tool is working the right way and be like very, very like sure that you're going to fail, but also be very confident that like you're going to see the other side eventually after a while. Um, and so it's really important. I think that like that relationship of that, that owner that's going to help you through the process the person being the apprentice to say, hey, I'm going to try a bunch and I'm going to fail, but I'm going to succeed eventually. Like all of those have to play into the factor of an entrepreneur getting that final success of being able to install that system or, or run that system and then save that money for the company. So it's just a process, but it's a process that once you're on the other side, you look back and you're like, I love the idea. I love the process and I would do it again. <laughs> So you bring up a good point. And, and so for our last question, I, I want to ask you to, to kind of continue on with that thought process, but maybe from the, the other perspective, which is um, you have these folks who are, um, they're feeling this this desire. They have that intrapreneurial spirit and they're ready to go. Um, how can leaders both at the executive level, but also at the mid-manage level, thinking from a, say a large corporation, mid-management level, how can they foster this, um, this kind of feeling or this environment uh, of being able to, to raise up more entrepreneurs within their organization? I think it starts with the culture and the hiring process. We specifically have, as part of our hiring process, a, a values that we, we hire for. And one of them is stay a student. And if you're hiring for that value and you're actually going through the HR process, you'll be filtered out from people that are not willing to stay a student. So therefore, the people coming into the business are going to constantly be learning. And I think the two things that happen that when I talk to the leaders at other companies, they get worried that someone's going to be too good or excel too fast, that they're going to want to leave the company. And I don't think a boss inside of a, an organization should be worried about that. You should want to harness the power of the employees that you have for as long as you can, because those are the types of employees that will move on, but they'll provide everlasting value for the company. So if you go through the values of, of with HR too, and you say, look, these are the people I'm trying to hire. Here's why I want to hire people that have these five values. Then you only look at candidates that have that, and therefore you're, you're already filtered. Then when you find the candidate that has that energy and that tenacity, don't be afraid to let them go as far as they can without worrying about losing them. And I think if you do all three of those things, it gives the ability for the entrepreneur, the intrapreneur to release their inner worldly ideas and feel free to do that without being punished. 
And it also gives the boss the opportunity to have true innovation inside of their company without trying to squash it or, or resist against people growing. I like that. I like that approach as well, um, because it does, it does allow you to experiment um, because the expectation is that you want people who are willing to try new things to support the, or the organization. And I believe you're right. As you look at it from a leadership perspective, um, especially these days, maybe 20, 30 years ago, everyone sort of expected, hey, my career is always going to be at, you know, mega huge corp where I've been for the past 15 years and I can't wait to retire with my gold watch. Um, those days are way, way long gone, right? So the activities that people are doing at an organization now should support and grow that organization. But to your point, the leaders should expect that, hey, we are going to have transitions. Maybe we can leverage these people who are entrepreneurs and they have this spirit innately to maybe inspire others around them. And I'm not going to squash that. I'm going to actually encourage that because That's that right. then generates that culture that you're looking for. That's right. And once you get that culture, it is it is so much fun to work inside of it because the people no longer want to shift out of it because the culture they helped create and the culture you helped harness is who their values are as well. Now you're creating, again, back to that Malcolm Gladwell, that tipping point, you're creating that community that just loves being together. And once you have that, and it's like, you know, every day you're waking up, you're excited, you're challenged, you're seeing joy by the end of your projects and you're seeing the results and the management is aligned with the employees, you're getting this, this momentum and that momentum is something that people don't want to leave. And so you'll right. see in, in the news all the time, people will say, you know, one of the greatest companies is, is for people to work for it back in the 90s, at least was Microsoft. And they kept saying how great it was to release the products and how powerful they were. And one thing I specifically remember when I was, um, we would push submarines into the water after we built them is people would cry. The, the people that built and the welders and the machinists and the, the actual workers that were doing the tasks of creating this large piece of metal that had a purpose and had a reason, the day we pushed that into the water and christened the submarine, there were tears, right? And that's a culture that you can create of, of people just loving their job and what they do, but it's also their, their passion, it's their relief, it's their vocation. And so when they see the end results, there's something inside of them that says, Let's go build another one of these because I love the results of the first one and I just want to do that again. And so that that all comes from culture. And if you can build that as a, as a boss or a manager, or as a founder, you do start to see the momentum pay off in the future. Well, I appreciate your perspective and I can definitely tell the passion that you come at this with. So I'm sure the folks that you're working with and those who work for you um, feel that same kind of passion in their jobs that they do every day. So I appreciate the way you approach that. Thank you. Um, Andrew, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate your perspectives, but also um, the conversation helped guiding and maybe changing our, our ideas about how we can leverage AI within our own organizations as either entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs or the bosses who are leading those folks in the organization. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun and, and thanks for listening.